This is the Child Discipleship Podcast. My name is Ross. I am so glad you're here. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, today, I am joined by Elizabeth Smith and Matt Markins. Elizabeth is the field chair of education and counseling and the program head and associate professor of children and family ministry at Moody Bible Institute. Elizabeth, welcome to the podcast. Matt, welcome back. I'm going to turn this over to you. I am so excited uh, for you guys to have this conversation today. Elizabeth, it has been so good this last a couple of years getting to know you. We first met at the Go Big Child Discipleship Conference up in Wisconsin, and then we reconnected this past year at the Child Discipleship Summit in South Carolina. And right away, when we got into that conversation, I just thought I've got to spend more time with you. And then, of course, we ended up, I ended up spending some time with you back in March uh, on the campus of Moody, just talking all things church, church history, child discipleship. And it was such a pleasure getting to know you. Really appreciate that time. Well, thanks for coming to Moody. You spoke to my students and certainly made a big impression. Uh, and Awana is making just waves in the world. You're going to make a difference. And I love what's happening and excited to be a part of it. Well, for, for our listeners, tell us a little bit about uh, what you do at Moody and tell, unpack a little bit about your program of studies there. So my education is actually in counseling psychology. So I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor. And when I got my master's about a million years ago, uh, I also got it in a concentration of systematic theology. So I have a very strong Christian biblical theological worldview. And putting that together, all of my experience and training has been with kids and families, both in the mental health world, but, but also within the church. I'm a senior pastor's wife, um, and we've been in church planting for most of our time. So working with kids and families. So I've taken all of that and working at Moody for about the last 18, 20 years, we train students who want to be on mission serving children and family, no matter matter where they go around the world. And I'm the professor that gets to interact with them about their passion for kids and families. And that's the largest uh, undergraduate program in the nation on children's ministry, I believe, correct? That's very true. Yes. Yeah. And we were rated uh, two years ago as number one. So wow. I love my faculty and what we teach and equipping uh, our students to be able to speak biblically, to teach the gospel, to do excellent uh, intentional ministry, building up families and kids so they can come to know Christ at a young age. Excellent. So if I'm listening, I'm going to want to know like, okay, this is interesting and wonderful, but how did you get, what's motive? what motivates you? How did you get involved in uh, academics and training the next generation? It wasn't, it was just like a lot of times in life, you just kind of happen. It's, I don't want to say it's a mistake, but uh, when we started church planting in the Chicago area, one of our elders at that time, he was the head of the department at Moody. And as he and I got talking and he saw my passion for kids and families and giving them that strong biblical mm -hmm. uh, framework, that biblical worldview, he goes, you got to come teach at Moody. But when I went there, I was looking at the program and they're like, well, what do you think? And I'm like, oh, we need a lot of work. We need to work because my students need to be best mm. when it comes to knowing Bible and theology, because if you know it, but you can't teach it to a six-year-old, then you don't know it, mm. right? That's what you have to do. So every class we do, whether it's our theology class, our teaching class, our counseling class, administrative skills, leadership skills, whatever we do, working with families who are in crisis and trauma is a strong biblical and theological worldview. It needs to start with God, be infused with God and end with God. And now we're doing ministry. And we have students literally from 40 countries and all around the world doing amazing things. And God's just laid that on my heart. And I got that opportunity and I've just kind of run with it. Mm. You know, when you and I were together uh, back in February, we were at this event together called the Child Discipleship Summit, and we we were discussing the old map and the new map of children's ministry. And we, we talked a little bit about it there, but we were together on the campus of Moody earlier this year. You really had the chance to to really unpack uh, this a little more for me. Uh, could could you talk to us about this old map, which which we we kind of articulate the old map of children's ministry. We we use a metaphor of maps, like maps have you know landscape. They've got a scale. They've got north, south, east, west. They've got uh, topography, but they also have cities, right? Like at the end of the day, we're trying to navigate from point A to point B. And in today's world, it's we're a world of cities. Um, and, and the old map of children's ministry has has one particular dominant city known as the church growth 
model. It's the city, like New York City, right? It's the city yeah. that influences other cities. And we, we articulate as being that being the driving force of the old map of the church, the old map of children's ministry. Of course, the new map, we would say, is more about uh, the, the faithfulness uh, and the fruitfulness of where the church is going. Uh, you know, in other words, what's forming our faith, not necessarily growing more people, although we want to grow more people, but it's more about how do we form people in the image of Jesus. But as we think about that old map, we were sharing at this event together um, that it's it's not about... Uh, it's not about shaming the past. It's about asking, should this dominant city remain the same dominant force that it was in the past? And so, yeah. so we talked about defining church growth and we defined it as this. Our team, our team put this definition together, which says the church growth movement is the stewardship of knowledge and wisdom to grow the church marked by emphasis on evangelism, missions, practical ministries, and numerical growth. Uh, and, and in many ways, I read that definition, and I think that's you know that's pretty common sense. That you know we want to steward our, the knowledge and wisdom that we have, of course, as it relates to evangelism, missions, practical ministries, and numerical growth. But those last two words, numerical growth, became mm. you know the driving force of all things church growth. Yep. So, so talk to us, like how did we get to a place? in the West in particular, mm -hmm. where this idea of numerical growth within the church growth movement, how did we get to the point where this became pervasive and dominant uh, in, in, yeah. in the West, in the United States? Yeah, and what a great question to ask. Sometimes to understand where we are, we have to figure out how we got here. So let's take a trip back about 70, 75 years to the first part of the 20th century. And at that time, maybe you might think of Andy Griffith's show in Mayberry. People yeah. went to church on Sunday mornings and you had Sunday dinner and you had your pastor and it was a part of our culture. It was a part of our tradition. Everybody went to church. But some might have thought, you know, that coming into the 1950s and a little beyond, like, um, it just seems a bit predictable. And like most generations, we always like something new. And at that time in the 1950s, there were two big books that came out. One was by uh, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, and it was about the power of positive thinking. And then the other was by Dale Carnegie, you know, how to um, win friends and influence. And it was all, and it was very then about power and growth. Um, and what happened is, is that there was a pastor named Robert Schuler, And as he was uh, reading these things, he actually decided to have a church in a drive-in, you know, where you drive your car and you watch the movie on the big screen. And as he was doing that, doing church a new way, he asked Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, hey, would you come and preach? Well, he did. Dr. Peale ended up standing on top of the concession stand. And as he's preaching his positive men message, which... Honestly, I would probably say you're not so bad and God's not so mad. You're fine. And think positively. You're going to be happy. Just think happy. And everybody loved it because I'm not so bad. This is fun. It's quick. It's new. We're at a drive-in. And the numbers end up becoming the Crystal Cathedral were huge, yeah. huge. And then because of the development of TV and media, they ended up being able to transmit these messages around the world. Well, it got the attention of a man named Dr. Gilbert Bilzekian, who was from Wheaton College, who also had a church model he was working on. And he incorporated some of this idea of positive thinking and really paying attention to somebody who might have questions. And so, of course, we're looking for unsaved Harry in the pews. And as he's developing this, and we're going to we're going to assess success, not in depth of belief or in faith, but really in numbers, both numerically with money and in attendance. And he had a disciple that we now know is Dr. Bill Hybels. So Bill ended up being kind of this disciple of Bill Zekian, and out of that comes Willow Creek. And these churches were insanely, insanely successful when it comes to numbers. But there was a prescription of what it was to look like, what you were to do. And the ultimate goal is if you come on a Sunday morning, instead of the church being a place of we are the church, 
And this is God's word. And we're going to teach God's word. And we're going to introduce you to God and his word. And then you'll need to interact with that. It was much more, this is God's word. And we can get 10 principles for a good marriage and five for a good financial. And so we kind of turn it into topical and we don't want to be offensive. And you're going to learn, like, hopefully you'll have relationships with people in there. And maybe they'll tell you about the gospel at some other time. But Sunday morning, all of a sudden became about evangelism and not really being offensive and just having people come. And it was, it was hugely successful. And I just want to clarify, I am not saying that people were not saved from this. My husband and I went to Willow Creek for a number of years, a long time ago. And um, we had some very positive experiences and lovely friends. And so, however, the question is, does that kind of a model sustain discipleship? Yeah. I know a lot of people that would go and they may be interested and hear something, but if they wanted to really grow in depth, they would actually have to find a different church. So, you so just, it could, you, oh, yeah, go ahead. You just gave us the history of church growth and probably a little less than five minutes. And we, you know, we could probably talk about like Donald McGavran and some of his missiological work, mm -hmm. and what he did at Fuller and some other places. And, yeah. and, and you certainly used a couple of key churches that were wildly influential, but certainly not the only churches. Like they were just mm -hmm. some, some not of the, the only. kind of the benchmark churches. But you know, mm -hmm. church church growth is uh, operating in a culture, right? So it was operating from from the Crystal Cathedral all the way through the birth of Willow in the seventies, eighties, and nineties, and beyond. Like that was in a what you might call in the U.S. a quasi Christian culture, right? So mm -hmm. so that was taking place with within a certain set of assumptions. Now fast forward to today, twenty twenty two, we're in a very different environment than we were then. So what question do you think the church growth model? was essentially answering in that in that time. And in, in other words, what was really the aim? You started to get at it right there at the end. I think it had had more to do with growth and less to do mm -hmm. with how is your faith being formed? Would, would you agree that that was mm -hmm. the question being asked or the certain set of assumptions in that point in history? Yeah, I think there was also a really big cultural change back in the 50s. Uh, even if you look at marriages, if you would ask somebody in the 50s in their marriage, how do you see yourself in your marriage? How would you define yourself? They would say, my goal is how, how am I doing within my role as a wife or a husband? How am I doing with that? Right. So how is my role and how is that affecting the community? That is now just totally shifted. And so even today, if you ask somebody about their marriage, they're really like, well, am I fulfilled? Am I happy? It be it's become individualistic. Yeah. So within those 50 years, we have shifted from a sense of community and cultural standards to individually assessing, does this meet a felt need? And Willow Creek was built on that idea of a felt need. My individual felt need must be addressed. And if that is being addressed, which will make me happier, you know, and it will make me uh, more fulfilled, then you know that I am walking with God and getting better. And so that kind of individual motivation for self-fulfillment, mm -hmm. I think was a lot of that underlying. And so, and where it affected, I think children and youth ministry, instead of asking kids out of Sunday school or, or coming out of Awana, well, Awana would always be, what did you learn? Did you enjoy it? Were you engaged? Did you pay attention? Of course. But what did you learn? Mm. It became, did you have fun yeah. on a Sunday morning? Did you have fun? Yeah. Do you want to go back? Because if it can be fun and you want to go back, then eventually they'll become a Christian. And so the emotional felt need became the biggest player on the board. And that radically changed then what programs look like, what Sunday school looked like, what everybody was kind of going after because it produced a response. Yeah. We got numbers out of it. You know, when you look at the work of, of Donald McGavern, which is connected into some of the figures you, know, you mentioned earlier, uh, his work and then what was expanded on it, there's, we see like five key markers of the church growth model. Uh, so let's event number one, evangelism, evangelism, number two, practical methods, number three, removing barriers, number four, focus on the most receptive and number five, target audiences. So again, it's not that all of these things are bad, like, like missiologically, mm -hmm. if, if you and I and a team are going into a certain country, we're going to go through some of these same processes of thinking, you know, where should we sure. focus our energy? It's it's not necessarily that that these are a bad set of assumptions. It's the obsession with with self 
and mm-hmm. the, the hyper focus on more people. Would you would you agree that those are like, mm-hmm. like that's kind of where where the plan got kind of off the rails a little bit? Yeah, I think I I really appreciate what you had to say. It was the emphasis, and it becomes this obsession. It's the only thing that we look at, and if we become that myopic in how we're seeing the thing, that's really not how God, when, when we look at, even in the book of Acts and we look at the church and how it's growing, like when was the five times in the book of Acts, when did the church grow? When it was being persecuted. Mm. So where within the narrative of the church growth movement is persecution and suffering? Mm. Maybe that felt need that you have, that's not getting met and that you're in pain. Maybe that's God's design to draw you closer into community with him closer into community with others around you and will give you because we do not grieve um like the what like those non-believers and because god ne- he always promises that while a situation may not be good god always brings good out of it what is god doing in the midst of your pain because god doesn't waste pain and we know that but that that conversation then isn't about let's hurry up and get over pain let's make this fun and good but when you're looking at this individual, uh, it needs to be practical. It needs to ha- not have barriers. I need to be able to feel fulfilled and be happy. And it needs to be fun. That's a very hard environment in which to talk about persecution and suffering. Mm-hmm. I would even then to say our, our savior suffered and died a horrific death on the cross. That is not pretty. And if the model is kind of media driven, active engagement, um, very much uh, participatory in the sense that kids are just having a great time, that amount of of energy and ethos, it's, it's hard to get across. You need a savior because you are that bad. We are sinners in desperate need of a savior. It's the greatest need that we have Mm -hmm. is for salvation and to know our God and for him to transform us into his image for his kingdom and his glory. This world isn't about me. That's a much harder message to get across when we're having such a good time Yeah, because it's a serious message. It's a painful message. And it's one where it's like, you may be persecuted for that. So when we became obsessed and started putting all of this emphasis on these other things, I think what happened is the place of scripture and the place of the gospel, you know, it became reworded. It became diminished in some ways. Almost repackaged. Yeah. Yeah. I I think Mm -hmm. it got repackaged. That's it. Yeah, I think about those five areas, evangelism, uh, those five areas that would be key markers of the church growth model, evangelism, pragmatic mo- methods, removing barriers, focus on the most receptive and target audiences. And then when you add in what you what you described earlier, which is hyper individualization, uh, then all of a sudden what you have is, is a movement away from the gospel and toward pragmatism. And I, that's yeah. really a lot of what I hear you talking about is the church growth model can put us in a position as a church where we start to lean on man-centered uh, uh, mm-hmm. thinking rather than spirit-driven, gospel-driven uh, thinking. So let's yeah. let's pivot this. Let, let's make a direct link and a direct connection. Because if I'm listening, I might be thinking, okay, what does this have to do with children's ministry? So, so you've spent a, a great bit of time thinking about how has all of this influenced and shaped children's ministry. So how would you answer that question? Mm. I think we have repackaged the message. I'm just going to repeat what you said and then maybe unpack that a little bit. Um, we, in, For example, let's take a lesson on creation. Ultimately, one of the points you should get out of the fact that God has created all of us is that God is our authority. You know, if I create something like a wanna and bar, you guys are creating this, I can't just take this podcast and go do whatever I want with it. That's not okay. The creator inherent inherently has authority and that authority then has expectations. And when we do not meet those expectations, that's not good. And spiritually, we call that sin. God created us. He owns us. He is an authority and we have not obeyed. And because of that sin, I am now deserving of the wrath of God. I am deserving of punishment and I do not have a relationship with him. What that became, the message became is God loves you. And he has a wonderful plan for your life, which isn't knowing him. And so invite Jesus into your life and he will be your forever friend. There's a lot of truth in we can talk about how God loves us and God as a friend and we can we want people to come to know Jesus. But it's a completely different method because we are afraid of some of the words 
we're afraid of some of that theology. Um, you know, we need to feel bad before the good news can be good, but we didn't want any of the kids to feel bad, right? If a kid left Sunday school and you asked your kid, how you doing? I had a horrible morning because I am a bad kid. I have a bad attitude. I don't love God. Instead of us going, you're getting it. Maybe the spirit is working to convict and to bring a reality of why Jesus is necessary and how amazing God is to himself coming to pay that penalty, to take on that punishment in my place. God got in trouble, so I don't have to. But instead, God loves you and wants to be your forever friend. How did we get there from sin and hell? I mean, a really good message on hell for kids Kids don't have as much of a problem talking about hell as adults do. The parents, I can't even, you know, 10, 15 years. Well, if you talk about hell, how will that affect the child's psyche? Um, well, first of all, it depends how you talk about it. I think I talk about it differently to preschoolers than I would, you know, adolescents, but I would talk about it. And it's not just a separation from God, like a timeout, a big timeout in the world. There is pain and punishment involved. Jesus had pain and punishment on the cross. Why? Because I deserve pain and punishment. And you can speak about that in an authentic, age developmentally appropriate way that we did for centuries until about up to the 1960s or 70s. And when you take away what I would consider the gospel, and Christ and what he has done for us and our understanding of who we are and who we could become in Christ. When you change how you say that message and you leave out parts of it, I would have to wonder, are some of our young adults leaving the church, not because they're rejecting Jesus, but because they don't know him. Mm. They don't know him. We have not introduced them to the real God. The conversations I have with students coming to Moody some of the things they do not know about the Bible and the gospel and what we would consider basics, things that in Awana we are covering at least by third grade, they've never been introduced to it. And that is because we gave them a message of fulfillment and joy and individualism, and it's just creating more chaos than it is any kind of a surety in their relationship with Christ. Well, let me let me connect some dots here. So we talked about ch that church growth is the dominant city on the old map of the church or the old map of children's ministry. And then I, I hear you kind of unpacking a little bit of what we would call the second and third city on the, the three cities on the map, which we would call those entertainment and the Bible light strategy. So if the dominant city is church growth, the second one would be entertainment, which is kind of like relevance. Mm -hmm. And then Bible light. So do, do I hear you saying in order to grow our church, we wanted happy kids, fun, thriving, entertaining children's ministry that kids could walk away with and say, I had a fun time. Mm -hmm. I want to come back next Sunday. But uh, somewhere along the way, we actually also went to what we call the Bible light strategy, which is yeah. teaching the Bible in such a way where th that we would say one of two things either happens on, on the right side you're going to go toward legalism or moralism. Mm -hmm. And on the left side, you go to moralistic therapeutic deism, which is sprinkling a little bit of Jesus on, on top. So, so I, I hear you saying with church growth being the driver, uh, we ended up, children's ministry ended up serving that strategy by going to mm -hmm. a highly entertaining, low view on the Bible type of model. Yeah, it, it came down. I mean, we deconstructed before deconstruction got exciting these last few years. We totally deconstructed that message. And then now they're doing it. And we're like so surprised where it comes from and saying, you know what? You cannot come to know God based on a bunch of rules, right? We don't want moralists and legalists. And you can't come thinking that all your needs and everything's going to feel great. And it's just going to be super fun. But every city, it's like dominoes. You had the major city and then the dominoes started. Yes. So whatever goes on in big church, it filters down. And then those are your next generations coming up. Um, and again, I lo love what you had to say, Matt. Evangelism is great. Of course, we want people to come. Yeah. Numbers aren't necessarily bad, right? But we have to look and say, what have we been teaching over the last 10 or 15 years? Where have we perhaps gotten off course? Where can re we reorient? Um, and it isn't all about me. And I, I think one of the things you said at the very beginning was this idea of community and relationship. It is our relationship with God, but we have that relationship with God through Christ 
And that needs to be taught clearly to children, but within the context of relationships. Mm. They need to have relationships with their teachers and the, and those other adults within the church and with their parents. It needs to be talked about in the morning and at night, on the way to soccer and on the way back. And we need to be sacrificing as Christian. If you're a Christian parent, you need to sacrifice your schedule. You need to get ready to be uncomfortable and inconvenienced so that church, Bible, prayer, conversations is the most important things you do during the week. Mm. And if then you have a chance to go to soccer, and if you have a chance to get really good other kind of, that's fine, but you have to keep the main things, the main things. And we do it within the community of the church. That was God's great idea. And then within that, we are supporting one another to really pour into this next generation wow, wow. of kids. I, I did not know we were going here. So let, let's 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 camp out on this just, just another minute longer. So so if let's say I'm a young I'm a young parent, which I'm not anymore. My kids are 20 and 18. But if I if I'm a young parent and I've got a, a six year old and eight year old, we're kind of just going into this world of soccer and football, baseball, basketball. Are you telling me that perhaps we should, you know if we're putting the big uh, big rocks into the jar you're saying those the first big rock is the discipleship and the faith formation of my children and things yeah. like soccer and violin and these other things come after that like like give me the courage as a parent to make that call yeah. because i'm looking around and none of the other parents in my community are doing that e really even parents at church may not be making those same level of priority decisions yeah. Why should I make this very important decision to orient my life around my child's faith formation first mm -hmm. and sports and other things later? Mm -hmm. Well, one day your child will grow up and whatever you have made first in their life, that's what they're first going to deal with. And so if you take that faith formation and you put it down the list and they start going into high school and college and they're no longer as they go to college interested in going to church or as they start dating and we're not going to get into should kids date or not or whatever. I'm just saying, as they start even considering those kind of relationships, do you want them to consider that, hey, the number one quality of the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with is someone dedicated to following Christ? Mm. If it has not been first mm. year after year after year, then the expectation should be as they get older, it's not going to be the first. They are going to question it, that you have got to invest now and it has to be the priority. A Christian family should look differently. Um, and one of the things we would do now, all of my kids are even older than yours, Matt. So I am definitely not in that young stage. My kids are all in their twenties. They're all married, um, but they're all in ministry and they've all married Christian families. Now I am not saying it's because we did everything right. Absolutely not. It's by the grace of God through the power of the spirit to draw them to the gospel. All right, let's just make that clear. But one of the things I'm glad that we did that I would say, if I had to do it over again, I would do the same thing, is that church and Jesus was always first. Mm. And if you talk to my kids today, one time we were going to get together as a family and one of the couple said, we can't come because there's a youth group trip and we're going to go to youth group. We are the leaders and we're investing in these kids. They will put church and their investment in what they're doing, serving in the church, more so than even spending time with us, which is what I want. I want them invested in the kingdom. And they all do that. They all go to church. And that is because it has been the number one thing. Now, were they all in soccer? Absolutely. They were in soccer and chess club and debate teams. And my daughter danced nationally. So we were very involved. But the reason we did those activities was to be a witness to the gospel and the belief in Christ that we lived day in and day out. And there were times we did not go to practice or we did not go to events because this was first. It was never questioned. The second thing we did is something that Awana is doing right now. Let's talk about it. We talked about it all the time. There was yeah. nothing that wasn't on the table. And when they started going to middle school, we would have you, okay, what are your questions? And we would have family dinners and we would start talking about scripture. By the time my kids were 10, the ideas of propitiation, substitutionary atonement, all this kind of stuff, it was normal. We talked about the intestinal period. We talked about all sorts of stuff because it was just our language. You can get into such great theology. You can get into such great truths of scripture if it is your lifeblood and that has to come from the parents. It has to be your, and that means you need to be in Bible study. You need to be studying and you have to take all the helps you can possibly get in the church and in others because in, you will never regret investing in your children. And you know what? If if, there, if your child becomes a prodigal, if it doesn't happen, you can still at the end of the day as a parent say, 
I gave it my all. Yeah. I, I, Christ is number one and we know prodigals and we know fabulous people that has, that is, but don't be a parent where your children are walking away from the faith and then you're regretting it. If only don't be an, if only parent, yeah. just, you're just not going to want that. So well, yes, sacrifice for that sake. For those of you listening at home, propitiation may not be in your weekly vocabulary. Having said that, like our, our, the decisions you're talking about are also decisions we made. My kids are, eight, like I said, 18 and 20, our two sons, and we do not regret those. We, we never let them get in more than one activity at a time, and we typically limit them to two a year. So if you had, if you had football in the fall, you could have a sport in the spring. But what we did yeah. not want is su such a level of hyperactivity that yeah. it kept our family moving at such a pace that we were not able to enjoy each other and to enjoy enjoy life and to have a relationship and discipleship happening in our home. And by the way, yeah. I do not regret that decision. So if you're a parent who's thinking about this, I encourage you to keep wrestling through that. It may be the best decision you ever make. So we've got to land the plane here. Let me mm -hmm. leave one last question. This, By the way, this has been incredible to hear from you uh, walking through an, an abbreviated version of of history of how the church growth model even came about, how it's affecting us, how it's formed us. Uh, but I think one thing we need to remember is this is all of us. Because if you're the Baptist church mm -hmm. from Cool Springs uh, Community Church in the hills of Kentucky, you very well may have had the, the, the gospel quartet come to what in to attract families to the community, right? That's a tractional church growth model. Or you might be in the metroplex of Dallas-Fort Worth in a mega church that had Stephen Kerr Chapman come for the weekend because you wanted to attract a lot of people. So my point is, we've all been a part of this. We've all been impacted and affected by the church growth model. But if I'm a kid's pastor and, and I'm listening to you, and I'm seeing, oh my goodness, we're wrapped up in this. We've got to move toward a better question, which is how do we form kids with lasting faith? How do I talk to my pastor about this? So give me one encouraging bit of advice. How can I go about talking to my pastor about uh, moving from the old map to the new map of children's ministry? You should buy stuff from Awana. That would be great. <laughs> but you need actually really good materials and you you want to go to your pastor and because so many pastors, you come up with an idea and they don't know where to go and they don't know what to do. But to say, you know, seriously, is we need to encourage pastors to say that the church family, the message of the gospel, training kids is to be happening in the home and it's to be happening in the church. And we are a church, a community of believers coming together, investing teaching, talking to our kids in the morning and the evenings and many opportunities as possible. It becomes who we are. It's our identity um, and having those relationships. And I think just saying, okay, where are we at as a church and how are we investing in the families that we have so they can be investing in their relationships with one another. And then they can go out into the community to invest in families in our community. But I am serious. You need to think about what materials do you need? What kind of helps do you need? Um, who do you may, they need to go, wow, I need to reach out to somebody that could help me maybe think this through. Attractional isn't necessarily bad, but we certainly don't want to stay there because we need to look back and say the church is a community of believers who need to be encouraged to live on mission for the gospel of Jesus Christ, to, to invest in God's kingdom for his glory. And we want to make sure we're doing that with our kids. I love that. Attractional isn't bad. So let's end with this, Ross. Attractional is answering the question, how do we get more people to our church to hear the gospel and to grow in their faith? Although that's a really good question. Uh, we would say there's a better question, and we think this is the future of the church, which is about formational. It's the movement from attractional to yeah. formational, and formational is answering the question, how do we form kids? How do we form families in the image of Jesus in such a way that's going to lead to lasting faith? That's the future of the church, is the church moving from attractional to formational. Formational is really where it's at. No, I— you know what, if, so if I had a second chance to answer that question, I would say attractional can be your starting point, but the road that leads to spiritual formation in kids and families is formational. Mm -hmm. And you need to get on that road and just, just take one step at a time saying, how are we investing in the, in the whole church community 
to invest in our kids and families so that knowing Christ and growing in him is the number one priority on Sunday morning and on Wednesday night and on Friday afternoon, but that that's where investing for formation. It's a, it's an eternal, it's an eternal perspective more so than a perspective that's just right here, right now.